Good afternoon. I hope you're all awake. I've been jumping to try and wake up because I'm asleep. Um, my name's Mariah. I'd uh, just like to introduce myself because nobody knows me because I don't talk to people. I am a machine learning engineer at Weave. You probably have never heard of Weave, but if you ever get a reminder text from your dentist that says, hey, are you coming tomorrow, and you text back yes, that means they use Weave. Um, I organize a ton of meetups. That's pretty much all I do in my free time is I organize meetups and conferences and all the like. And I have the world's best dog. His name is Max. And I wish he could come to everything, but then I wouldn't do anything either. So um, whenever I talk about machine learning and Go, there are so many questions to ask that I really just wanted to set a good expectation for this talk. Um, I'm not going to talk about which is better, Go or Python. I'm not going to talk about why we should be doing machine learning in Go, why it's the best language. I'm not going to talk about neural networks and how they work and all the crazy math and this, that, and the other that gets super deep and convoluted. And it's pretty much not any of that stuff. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, but to get started, what is machine learning. I'm sure you've all wondered, because everybody talks about AI, it's the big thing. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is a way of solving a problem. Just like anything, when you go to build a piece of software, you have a problem, and you're trying to put code together to solve that problem. With machine learning, you're trying to use data to find a model that replicates a solution to a problem. So it's not the same process, but it does the same thing more or less. A really easy way to think about machine learning is just a really, really convoluted, disgusting switch statement. You know, have you ever written that piece of code where you have two cases, then you go back, and then two weeks later you have to add a third, and then you find an edge case, and you have to add 16 more cases later on? That's what machine learning is for. So you never have to have a 20-case switch statement ever again. So what does machine learning do? Um, there are three types of main problems that machine learning is really, really good at. The first is classification. This is most commonly used in your email spam classifiers. This has been doing it for nearly a decade. You get they just figure out what an email is, if it's spam, if it's not spam. There are many other ways to do it, but this is literally the biggest benefit we all experience on the daily. The next one is the pattern recognition. Who's ever heard of GANs? Who's heard of a deep fake? I was expecting more hands for deep fake. So GANs is, called, is a general adversarial network. And it has trained itself to recognize the pattern. One of the most common patterns it recognizes is people's faces. It's been fed thousands and hundreds of thousands of faces, and it recognizes what makes up a face, and it generates them. If you go to thisisnotaperson.com right now, you'll get a generated GAN's face. It is not a real person's face, but it is generated to look like a real person. And then another one that is huge is pattern recognition. All of the big finance companies right now are employing data scientists to get the most predictive algorithms so that they can do better stock trades, so they can have better insurance prices, so that they can be more competitive in the market through forecasting and through predicting. Now, these are great, but what, how do we attack them? There are three different ways that we can attack a machine learning problem. The first is called supervised learning. This is the most common one. This is the one that requires all of that data that nobody knows where it comes from. And it's very similar to traditional learning. We go to school, and a teacher tells us, OK, 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 2 is not 5, 2 plus 2 is not 3. Same way, we're giving a model data, and we say, OK, this is a dog. It is not a cat. It is not a lizard. This is a dog. And we do that for hundreds of thousands of millions of data points so it can learn the similarities. Then there is unsupervised learning. This is more like the eureka moment, when you discover something on your own. This is when we give a model hundreds of thousands of millions of data points without a label. And we say, OK, what are the connections? What does this mean? Inference something for me. And we let the model figure things out and teach us. And then the last one, which is my personal favorite, 
which is reinforcement learning. Now this is an optimization problem. <laughs> Basically, we're giving a model a task. Now this task is going to be put the block in the container. And it can do several things. It could put it in a triangle hole, it could put it in a square hole, it could put it in a round hole. And it does all of these things until it finds the best solution. The best solutions obviously take off the top, but it has to try all the different things before it finds that solution. With all of these different methods, there's so many things to do. So I want to talk about an approach that any software engineer can take to implement machine learning in their models using a simple library called GoLearn. This is basically a Go equivalent of the very common scikit-learn in Python. So first, linear regression. Who here took algebra in high school? You should all raise your hand or else you did not graduate from high school. <laughs> um, in algebra, they give you a big old plot of points and say, OK, draw me a line that goes to the middle of all these points. That's your line of best fit. This is all linear regression is, is we're drawing a line that defines the data. It could be a line that defines a separation between two classifications. It could be drawing a line that follows the data, but we're just drawing a straight line between the data, just like we did in algebra class. Um, this data is always supervised. We're trying to determine what this data means. It can have two labels, such as one, the blue and the orange are the two different labels. And there can be many features as to why those labels are true, and then we get our line. This right here is an example from TensorFlow um, Playground of how man models are trained. Essentially, a random line is picked, and then that line changes until it becomes most accurate. That's how these models are trained, over and over again, based on randomness and then basically minimizing the error. Logistic regression is the exact same thing as linear regression, except for it's a different shaped line. And we can apply this with a whole bunch of different lines. We can do quadratic lines. We can do cubic lines. We can do hyperbolic tangential lines. Um, whatever kind of line that fits your thing, you can use in this kind of graph. So I want to show real quick implementation of how you do this and go. First thing first, you've got to get your data. So this data is just advertising data. It shows how many times somebody went into a store based on how many times a commercial played on TV. So we get 280 times a commercial played on TV up to 25 times somebody went in a store. Really easy. So we pull it in off a of CSV. Then we put it, we have to split it. We want to split it between our training data and our testing data. What are we going to teach the model on? What are we going to test the model on? Here, you can see right there, after, there is a 0 0.70. That means we're doing a 730 split. We're going to use 70% of our data to train on and 30% to test on. Then we want to, oh, did I not? I skipped one. Haha. -ha, then right underneath, it's hidden. There's this part that says r.fit. And that's what we're saying, OK, find me the line of best fit. What line best shows me? the average for return on my uh, TV uh, advertising. Then we want to predict it. Oh, did I go the right way? I went the wrong way. Then we want to predict it. We want to say, OK, use my test data to determine if my line makes sense, if it's correct, if my errors gave me the right answer. And when all is said and done, it looks like this. That's not very many lines to get a nice little model working in training. That's like 15 lines. Somebody can count them. And you'll get a line that goes through it that's relatively OK, not that bad. These can cover a whole ton of simple classification problems, really easy to implement, really easy to train. You can put it in any piece of software with just that many lines. So I want to talk about something a little bit more complicated. And this is a decision tree. Does this look like a uh, software architecture drawing to anybody? That's essentially what it is. Um, Instead of having just, you're, you're, doing, you're building nodes to turn, determine between two or more things. And you can get a whole bunch of classifiers off of this. I was told once that this is the workhorse of machine learning. You can apply this to so many different tools that this is just used everywhere. So I want to start out with some data I pulled off of Twitter. So I am a soccer fan. 
Uh, and so this all data is tweets about the 2008 World Cup that I found on Kaggle. So I just pulled it down, and using a data frame, I put it into a view that's kind of like a table. First part of machine learning is understanding what your data is. And I really want to point out the stuff down here at the bottom, and I'm going to use my little pointer so that it's uh, really obvious. You see right down here how there's a whole bunch of fields that are not displayed. The first part of machine learning after seeing what your data is is called feature engineering. We have to determine what in the data is valuable. So I went and said, OK, well, I have a labeled string that's called the name. And then I have a whole bunch of other words. So I can pick out labeled names and not names and build the classifier between what is a name, what is not a name, and include Twitter handles in that because I have user mentions right there. So I can put call Twitter handles a name, people's names a name, and start doing a classifier between names and not names, assuming Twitter handles are names. So let's do that. So I pulled all that stuff out just using searches and whatnot and built a new data frame. Now, this is the CSV data frame that I'm going to use, and it has over 700,000 labeled words in it. That's not bad. And they're labeled name or not name, and some of them occur more than once. Like this, Shyam occurs 41 times. That means they're either popular or they tweeted 41 times. If you got a soccer player's name up there, you should get more than 100. Like Mbappe, I'm sure, has a couple thousand. Um, so going forward, we're going to, just like before, read in that CSV data. It's going to come in from the file, and it's going to be put into words. Words is going to be a table with a whole bunch of features and a label at the end. Then we're going to split it. Same again, 70-30 train, train test split of our word data. The thing to note is that when it does the split, it randomizes it as well. Notice how we had all of the first top when we were looking at, they were all is name. Well, if you did a 70-30 split and the first half were all is name and the last half were all not name, that means your last 30% are all not name and that's not going to work. You're going to get an error. So it's good that this train test split automatically randomizes our data so we get better answers. Next thing is we're going to define a model and we're going to fit it. Now, another thing that's really important here is there's a number this right here, we're going to form a decision tree with a 0.06 weight on it. And that weight is a little bit of stochasticity or randomness. That means that we're going to allow things to be put in the wrong node on accident so that we can determine if there's more features that might be beneficial later on. This allows us to have a more complete and more complex model when we go to train if, per se, some things become more important. For example, if you're doing a feature and you're trying to determine between cats and dogs, and your first thing is you say, OK, let's go with does it have pointy ears? And so cats, so but you first go pointy ear, yes, cat, pointy ear, yes, cat, pointy ear, yes, cat. And then you go down here, and you have a randomness down there, and it turns out that one of those pointy ears was actually a boxer whose ears have been clipped. Then you can go with tongue length, and it goes back down the other way, back to dog. So that randomness allows you to understand if more features are important. So after we have fit it, just like we did before, we can then run our predictions on it. Now these predictions are used to determine an accuracy. Now these accuracies are expressed in something called a confusion matrix. It's called the confusion matrix because it's confusing and doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I am not joking. Um, so. I want to go over that a little bit. So what a confusion matrix expresses is how often we're right when we want to be right and wrong when we want to be wrong. Pretty simple. Uh, and this is essentially when we evaluate something, when we predict on it over a huge data set, this is what it's going to be showing us all the time. How often are we right when we want to be right? How often are we wrong when we want to be wrong? And this is shown right here. And now this little picture is from Wikipedia. If you Google Wikipedia recall precision, it's going to show you this. And it's my favorite picture in the whole world because it makes sense. The other pictures don't make sense. So right here, we have a true positive. That means 
Okay, we thought we, we were choosing between cats and dogs. We said it was a dog, and it really was a dog. Good job. Then we have false positives. That means we said it was a dog, but it was a cat. False positive. You have false negatives. That means we, so if the dog is positive, right? In my example, dogs are positive. We said it wasn't a dog, but it was. And then you have true negatives. We said it wasn't a dog, and it wasn't. So that's what these are choosing between. And we use certain metrics to kind of express that in a confidence score. Now these look like percentages. They're not saying we're right 69% of the time. We're saying we have a confidence to the 0.69 out of one that this will work. So it's almost like a percentage, but it's not because there's no guarantee. So in our little word example that we trained, it said that we had about 222 false positives, uh, true positives, excuse me. That's not bad, as opposed to, I mean, at least a third of the time, two thirds of the time we were right. That's not too bad. Um, that means our precision is a, it has a 0.688 confidence. And precision and recall, they just mean, one means, the really easy way to think about it is precision says we are accurate most of the time. And recall says we are safe most of the time. A good example of this would be a medical diagnosis. Say you are doing a cancer for classification off of images. You're going to want to err on the sides of false, neg false positives more than false negatives, right? You want to be more cautious that somebody doesn't have cancer when they say we do, so we can do further tests and follow up, as opposed to leave somebody undiagnosed who really does have cancer. In other cases, such as financial cases, we, we care more about being accurate. We, like having more false positives is bad. We want to be more accurate more of the time. It depends on your use case, what you want to tune for. For mine, I would care more about the precision being accurate than false positives, so I would tune so that my precision is higher than my recall. But overall, for a one pass, no parameter, 69.69 uh, precision is really not bad. Um, that's, for a lot of models, that's production ready. Uh, true, uh, that's, uh, most models go into production with a 0.68 and a between 0.65 and 0.80 uh, precision or uh, accuracy. And are you an expert yet? Oh, dang it. I guess my talk failed. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, all of my examples have been put into the Go Learn library under examples. I haven't merged them in that. So you do have to check out my fork to see my examples. There are more in the library that you can go learn from. Um, there are also some really good machine learning and Go tutorials uh, that uh, Daniel Whitenack has put together for the GopherCon uh, workshops. On the second one, I've helped with. Also, Google's machine learning crash course is amazing. We're doing it at Weave to help our software engineers become better equated with machine learning so we can start putting it into our products as quick as possible and not have to worry about building up our own data science infrastructure. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to hit me up on Gopher Slack or on Twitter. And uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you.